My name is Juan Manuel Pedrosa. I'm Assistant Professor of Sociology here at UC Santa Cruz, and I'll be moderating this university forum. So welcome. Uh, title of the forum is Immigration Policies in the United States, Understanding Violence and Nationwide, <clears throat> sorry, Understanding Violence Nationwide and in Santa Cruz. The UCSC University Forum is an ongoing series focusing on the relevance of our research to the community and to the social, economic, environmental, and political issues that we study. We proudly feature the impact of this research conducted by faculty at UC Santa Cruz. This forum is co-sponsored by the Institute for Social Transformation. And before we begin, I'd like to share a few details about the event today. Uh, first, we're using a webinar tool so that there's no chat function during the event. Instead, we'll have an opportunity to answer questions at the end of the program. So we invite you to submit any questions that you have in the Q&A question and answer box uh, here using the webinar tool at any time during this event. Tonight's event will be recorded. So let's start with a description of this problem and then we'll be introducing our, uh, our guest speaker, Professor Linghau. So deportation. Deportation is far more than a policy term. Uh, it's a threat that undermines a family's livelihood and peace of mind. It's an act with explosive impact on families and communities. Over 5 million children living in the United States right now are in the care of individuals vulnerable and at risk of deportation. Many are at the risk of deportation, even after having been in this country for decades. And many face persecution, including torture, violence, and death, uh, the impossibility of a return, a safe return to their home countries. And we know that family separation has immediate and long lasting psychosocial and economic consequences, both for those deported and for those left behind and separated from their loved ones. And yet in the face of fear, and increasingly harsh policies designed to disrupt immigrants' lives. Communities have organized and responded to all of these policies and built resilience. UC Santa Cruz professor of psychology, Regina de Langhout, is lead author on a policy brief titled Statement on the Effects of Deportation and Forced Separation on Immigrants, Their Families, and Communities. Tonight, she will discuss the far reaching impacts of deportation and the collective resistance to those restrictive policies. Professor Langhout's research examines empowerment in schools, our neighborhoods, and the workplace. As a critical social community psychologist, she's best known for her youth participatory action research, otherwise known as YPAR, with nine to 12 year old Latinx children. Indeed, she's been asked to speak about or has given workshops on YPAR with young people across the Americas. Most recently, her work has focused on state-led violence against immigrant communities. She's a fellow of the Society for Community Research and Action and an associate editor of the American Journal of Community Psychology. So without further delay, I wanna introduce our speaker, Professor Langha. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you so much, Juan, for getting us started. And so before I begin, welcome to everyone. And before I begin, I would like to start with the land acknowledgement. The land I am on is the traditional and unceded territory of the Yupi tribe of the Oswas Nation. Today, these lands are represented by the Ama Mutsun Tribal Band, who are the descendants of the Oswas and Mutsun Nations, whose ancestors were taken to Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Batista during Spanish colonization of the central coast of California. Today, the Ama Matsen are working hard to fulfill their obligation to the creator to care for and steward Mother Earth and all living things through relearning efforts and through the Ama Matsen Land Trust. I do my best to work in solidarity by questioning how Mission Santa Cruz is represented to the public and pushing for a more accurate representation, working against violence in my own community and learning about and teaching decolonial philosophies. So before I begin today, I just want to give a little bit of a content warning. 
Um, some of the material I'm going to talk about today is going to be an explicit description of um, ICE raids that have happened. So um, I'll be sharing with you some testimonials of individuals who have experienced these raids. So I just want to let you know that that will be coming in the second half of the presentation. And just to take care of yourself, if you need to step away, um, please do so. And I also want to point out that what I'm going to be talking about today are uh, current immigrants. Of course, immigration, there's a long history of immigration in the US. And many of us are here because our ancestors immigrated here or because our ancestors were um, captured and enslaved and brought here. So I just want to point out that, that when I'm using immigrant, I'm talking about um, current immigrants. And so I want to start with my own family's immigration story, just so you have a sense of that. These are some of my ancestors. The woman on the left is um, the family member of mine who immigrated um, from Holland to the US. And my family's story about this is that she was married to a very bad man named Fike Ficus Ficuma. And um, nobody ever says more about what is meant by a very bad man, but she prayed for relief for, from him. And two weeks later, he had passed away. And she um, took her 13 children and got on a ship and came to the US and settled in Iowa. And, um, and my family was a family of farmers. And so that's the way that my family has always told the story. Nobody had any papers. She just came and that was that. Um, and more recently, I started to look up what was going on in the US and in the world during this time period. This is the mid 1800s. And part of what I learned is that this is when the, the US had passed the Homestead Act as a way to colonize um, the Midwest of the US and with that Homestead Act and the dividing up of the land and turning it into farmland, what ended up happening was wheat was exported across the globe and that depressed the price of wheat in other places. Um, and so wheat farmers could no longer survive in with what, what they had been surviving with before in terms of the money that they were making from their crops. And so that describes my family as well. So they actually, migrated to the US because I think partially, you know, as farmers and coming into Iowa, there was a lot of migration at this time of farmers from um, Holland to places like Iowa. And so I think it's interesting to think about these um, global policies and how they matter in terms of migration and what that means for the US. And of course, we can think about the parallels, you know, much later in terms of NAFTA um, and the price of corn in Mexico. And of course, the situation is also different because my family had and has white skin privilege and was able to come without papers. But I just think it's interesting to make these connections. So I just want to start with that to situate myself a little bit in terms of this, this um, presentation that I'll be giving today. So I'm gonna organize this around a violence model. This model comes from Galtung, who is a sociologist and a mathematician. And he worked in the field of peace studies. And essentially what he wanted us to think about was that when we think about violence, we often think about um, direct violence only without thinking about additional aspects of violence. So he wanted us to understand violence as having multiple components that could all work together. So probably the kind of violence that we're most um, used to thinking about is direct violence. So this is an event such as a killing, an ICE raid, or the detention of a social group. We can think of deportation as direct violence as well. But another aspect of violence is cultural violence. So cultural violence is any aspect of culture that is used to justify violence. So examples might be language, ideology, narratives, who gets to produce knowledge, what gets counted as knowledge, and the control of public space like schools, streets, and courts. So the third um, piece of this triangle then is structural violence. So structural violence then is the production, maintenance, and reproduction of oppression, 
usually based on race, gender, immigration status, et cetera, any of these social identity markers, whatever they might be. So Galtung reminds us that this triangle can be oriented as standing on a, a leg or a corner, resulting in six possible orientations. The components of violence intermingle with one another or happen together. So if we look at this top left corner, an example would be that sexual assault might be direct violence that happens based on the cultural violence of ideologies about masculinity and femininity and structural violence like few sexual assaults being prosecuted in courts. Another example in the top right is that direct violence, the direct violence of sexual assault and the structural violence of the pay gap can facilitate sexist jokes, which would be the cultural violence. So we can see here that um, these all work together. And what I'm gonna focus on is something that looks more like this bottom um, triangle because it's one that we don't, at least in the social sciences, think about all that often. So this, then this slide is a little bit of a um, outline of the talk. So I'm going to be talking about how direct violence in the form of uh, deportation, detention and ICE raids, how this direct violence can then facilitate cultural and structural violence, cultural violence through an us versus them ideology, narratives that are held about immigrants, and then structural violence in the form of percepticide, and I'll be defining that later, and how these all work together to reduce community cohesion, solidarity, and mobilization. So if you prefer to see an outline this way, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about direct violence. I'll talk a little bit about some ice raids that happened in Santa Cruz in 2017. And then I'm going to go into deportation as a form of direct violence. And I'll be talking here about the Society for Community Research and Action policy brief that Juan mentioned. And then I'll talk about cultural violence in Santa Cruz after those ICE raids in 2017 in the form of um, an ideology of us versus them and narratives and then also structural violence through percepticide or forced looking away of what was happening in Santa Cruz in our community here. So I'm going to start with talking about ICE raids and deportation and how this reduces community cohesion. All right, so I want to um, remind those of you who live here in Santa Cruz that in February of 2017, there were some ICE raids. And these ICE raids happened um, in our community in a couple of different neighborhoods. There were 92 DHS um, ICE or Homeland Security agents, and they were in two neighborhoods. We know that there were at least 21 Santa Cruz police who were also deployed to these two neighborhoods, um, but we don't know how many. Um, all of the accounts that I can find as a person who's not connected to the police department says at least 21. And this raid happened based on a five-year investigation. There was the use of helicopters and flash grenades at 4 a.m. in these two neighborhoods. Now, remember, this is February, so it's quite dark outside at that time. Most people are sleeping. And what happened is that 10 or 12 men were arrested due to their alleged involvement with MS-13. And I say 10 or 12 because the court documents, which I've been able to gain access to, they vary from 2017 and 2018. So charges were added in August of 2018. So that was over a year after this raid happened. And you might think like, how could they hold these men for a year without adding any charges? This is because they were also being held on immigration um, violations. And this is a civil offense, not a criminal offense. So everything that we think about in terms of the constitution, the rights that we might have to um, you know, a speedy trial, to, to know what we're being held on, none of this applied in the same way. So eventually there were plea bargains, which is um, quite common. Very few cases go to trial. Most cases are plea bargains in the US system. These plea bargains happened between January 2019 and March 2020 for 10 of the men. There were sentences given from the courts for 10 of the men between um, June 2019 and November 2020. And two men are set for trial um, either in fall of 2021 or spring of 2022. In addition to these 12 men, 
10 more were, um, you know, this term that, that gets used a lot that I think most people know swept up in the raids. Um, and I try not to use this term because I see this as a form of cultural violence because it's basically equating people to garbage, right? Because they're being swept up. So there were 10 more people who were, who were um, detained during this period, during this raid. And the community at large didn't really learn that about these additional 10 people until between the first and the second city council meetings that happened just the day after this raid and then two weeks after that raid. So this sets our context in Santa Cruz. So I just want to remind you of this. It was a heavily militarized event that impacted many, many people across two neighborhoods, people who were not targeted in this particular raid um, and who were also bystanders of this raid. So this raid, um, I'm gonna transition into the, the Society for Community Research and Action Policy Brief because this gives, gives us some context for how these deportations often occur or what precedes the deportations. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about current policies. Um, our current policies are a ratcheting up of policy changes that happened in the 90s under the Clinton administration. And then again in 2001 under the Bush administration. During these periods, this country moved away from family reunification, which was the immigration policy since World War II and increased administrative authority and also decreased judicial oversight. So it's important to note that Obama deported more than anyone before him and also sent in terms of from the interior of the US. So this was not a change in policy and everything that's happened under the Trump administration is also not a change in policy. It's simply new enforcement of current policies or a ratcheting up of these policies. Even family separation at the border happening under the Trump administration where 5,500 children were separated from their parents, where over 600 children are still not reunited. This is the ratcheting up of current policies. And it's vital that we understand this because when we do, we understand that these laws need a drastic overhaul. So it's important to note that also 79% well, a majority of people who are deported from the interior have no criminal convictions. And the median time that people are in the US who are deported again from the interior is 14 years. So these are really our neighbors. And I think that's important to know and to hold on to. Many have US citizen children and 79% of screen families in family detention have what's called a credible fear claim. So this, this relates to asylum and who gets asylum is specific and it ignores many forms of violence so that almost 80% meet the standard for a credible fear claim means that if other forms of violence were included, the numbers would certainly be higher. For example, one study documents that 83% of their sample of Mexican immigrants without authorization to be in California have experienced significant trauma tied to human rights violations. So asylum categories, just to remind us, these are a fear of persecution in the, their country of nationality that's well-founded because of race, religion, nationality, social group, or political opinion. So then we also wanna think about the effects on individuals of deportation. So many return to the turbulent environments that they were fleeing in the first place and some face violence upon return when they're deported um, in the, the forms that I have on the slide here um, and more. Also, we know that there are higher rates of depression for people who are deported, but mostly what we know is that there needs to be a lot more research on the psychosocial effects on the individual who is deported. This, at least in terms of psychology, has been much harder to carry out because we don't always know where people go to and don't always, aren't always able to follow people. We know a lot more about the effects on family of um, the, the people who remain in the US uh, because they're still in the US so they're easier to follow. So it's important to note that 10% of US born children are in mixed status families. And by mixed status, I mean that at least one person in the family has 
um, authorization to be in the US. So that might be citizenship, it might be a green card. Um, and one person doesn't have authorization to be in the US. So if we know that these are the statistics US wide, by logic, we have to assume that these numbers are much larger in the state of California. We also know that it's mostly men who are deported. So the research is pretty clear. In terms of this policy brief, we reviewed about three decades of literature. So this is regardless of um, who is in power at the time in terms of the administration. Um, and these results are consistent. So we know that there are negative psychosocial effects for children. We know that children tend to have eating and sleeping disturbances. They increase their crying, anxiety, anger, aggression, isolation, et cetera. In addition to these um, more individualized psychosocial effects, they also have a lot of negative effects in terms of how they do in terms of school. So they have they experience more academic withdrawal, lower persistence and retention rates in school. And there are attachment issues due to that sudden separation or, or that severed parent-child relationship. So oftentimes, just like in the raids that happened in Santa Cruz in 2017, there's no warning and there's no notice. And all of a sudden, one of your parents is just gone with no preparation. So obviously this is going to have long-term effects on attachment. In terms of the family unit, I uh, already mentioned that it tends to be men who are deported. So these families often um, face a lot of economic hardship and the families, again, just in the blink of an eye, lose between 40 to 90% of their income um, with an average of 70%. So obviously this is going to have immediate and also long-term effects for the family. Often this looks like housing instability, um, food insecurity, not having enough money to buy food. Um, if there are older children in the household, they often need to work or engage in a lot of child care so that the parent who is left in the household can take on multiple jobs to um, try to take care of this economic um, hardship that's happened. We know in terms of mothers, they often become single parents within a few moments if it's the mom who is, who is left behind. And we know that what this often means is that moms work multiple jobs. And this of course is going to lead to reduced contact with their children. And also an increased fear of losing their children either to the Department of Homeland Security or to Child Protective Services. So it also means they'll be less likely to reach out because of this fear. And, um, you know, if this mom has been in relationship with a partner, then there's the severed romantic relationships as well. Now, the answer is not to deport the entire family. As research shows, children who are deported with family members suffer from profound adjustment difficulties and have a very strong sense of loss regarding their futures. All right, so in terms of the family then, to continue on with the family, to move from the children um, to, the, and to the moms, to the families in general, we know that others who are left become fearful and mistrust public institutions. So they are less likely to reach out for healthcare, to go to the emergency room, even if there is an emergency. They're also more likely to refuse to call or talk with police, even if they're the victim of a crime. And this research indicates that it's not only people who are unauthorized who have this fear, but in this particular case, these samples are with Latinx communities, um, that anybody who is Latinx in these communities where there has been um, raids and deportations are less likely to reach out even if they are the victims of these crimes. And there's a general increase um, fear of police. So we have to also remember that oftentimes um, ICE agents will you know, say that they are police or have uh, vests or, or different things that they're wearing that say police. We know that families stop using or they reduce their use of social health and public services. Again, because of that, that fear of what might happen with the use of, of public services after you know, the state has, has um, perpetuated this kind of violence or been a perpetrator of this violence. 
And with all of this, civic engagement decreases and social isolation increases. And so there's basically a general pulling back of um, being civically engaged in society. So it means that the parent who's left and other parents in the community might, for example, stop going to um, parent teacher uh, you know, meetings or going to PTA meetings or going to open house for the school or, you know, holiday concerts or any of these kinds of things or going to the park or going to neighborhood association meetings. Um, and this also has negative mental and physical health effects for the people who are now more socially isolated than before. So if we wanna think about communities in general, these effects are widespread. So as somebody who's trained as a social community psychologist, this is also a really important part of this story for me. So we know that these effects um, are held also for people who are eyewitnesses of ICE raids. So just you know, bystanders um, of deportations and uh, for, of raids and deportations. Um, also, we can see these effects for people who just hear about raids and deportations later, um, who are in the region, or also, unfortunately, from social media. And we know, you know, in this day and age, uh, these stories circulate on social media, so the effects are very widespread for this reason. And so far, there hasn't been a lot of research to look at uh, how long-term these impacts are. The research that goes out the, the furthest that we found for putting together this policy brief was about two years out. And what we found here, or you know, the research here, what it reports is that parents still daily report feeling sad, fatigue, hopeless, anxious, fearful, mistrustful, worried, et cetera. There are also negative physical health outcomes. And for the children, they also still two years later exhibit poor school performance, depression, anxiety, fear, shame, and secrecy about what happened. It's also the case that Latinx children, again, the group that this research was done with, even if they don't have direct contact with anyone who is deported, what it does is it increases for them a sense of social stigma. They also fear their own deportation, regardless of their legal status, because they're identifying with the people who were deported. And there's a fear and secrecy if immigrants are in the family, regardless of their status, because of the way that the, the term immigrant is um, flattened to mean only people who don't have authorization. So in terms of those of us who who wrote this policy brief and put it together, we really wanted to highlight that what's happening with raids and deportations and forced family separations is a public health crisis. And this is really important for us to understand. So you might ask why. There are several reasons. One is that we know that the people who are suddenly removed are longtime community members. These are our neighbors. They've been here for you know, 14 years is the median time. We know the use of public resources decreases. And with that, when people are isolated, when we have such disparities in terms of um, the economic impacts, all of these issues, what happens is that this creates larger community level inequities in our, in our neighborhoods, in our society in general. And with these inequities, we also have the disintegration of our social fabric. And when we have these huge inequities in our society and our social fabric disintegrates, what happens is that this weakens well being outcomes for everybody in the community, the entire community. So, research shows that when education levels are disparate in a community, for example, the life expectancy is less for everyone. When there are big income gaps in the community, there are poorer mental health outcomes for everyone who lives in that community. There are other examples too. The point is that community level inequality is bad for everyone's health, for my health, for your health, for everyone. So this is why we call this a public health crisis. It affects all of us. Of course, it affects us differently, but you know, make no mistake, it affects all of us. 
so what I've talked about so far is how ICE raids and deportations reduce community cohesion. And what I'm going to go into next is more specific to Santa Cruz so that we can start to see some of the story behind this in terms of how these ICE raids in Santa Cruz also facilitated more structural and cultural violence. This, and um, the structural violence in the form of percepticide, the cultural violence in the form of us versus them and narratives about immigrants and how all of this worked to reduce community cohesion and solidarity in our community. So in terms of percepticide, just as a reminder, structural violence is the production, maintenance and reproduction of oppression, which is usually based on these um, social identity categories such as race, gender, immigration status. So percepticide then is a form of structural violence. Percepticide occurs when a population is not allowed to acknowledge the violence taking place around it. It's a forced looking away through implicit collaborators that make a population silent, deaf, and blind to a violent situation. So Diana Taylor coined this term percepticide based on her work understanding the dirty war in Argentina. She creates this term based on this work, yet she also says that the tactics of terror and the systematic victimization of subjugated peoples lives on throughout the globe. I therefore use percepticide as an appropriate conceptual tool for thinking about structural violence in our community. And as a reminder, cultural violence is any aspect of culture that can be used to justify violence. So I'll talk mostly about how ideology can be used toward culturally violent means. So these can happen via an us versus them ideology. So language that separates and others, a social group, in this case, immigrants, and also narratives about immigrants. So for example, viewing immigrants as quote, criminals for crossing the border or just generally criminalizing immigrants. Okay, so I'm going to read to you now from the city council meeting that happened the day after these raids in Santa Cruz in February of 2017. I have part of the quote up here. I'm gonna to read to you the entire quote. So this community member, she um, gives this testimonial to the city council. So she says yesterday, at 4 a.m. I heard a big bomb in my complex. I live on City Avenue. So I changed the names of the streets here. I live on City Avenue. And so me and my husband got up really scared because we didn't know what was happening. We looked through the window and the back, the back court. There were a bunch of, we thought they were a bunch of soldiers because it was dark. We couldn't see them. They were carrying big guns. They were pointing them everywhere. So I told my husband, just get down on the floor. I don't know what's happening. They started screaming, hands up, hands up. So we just got on the floor and then on our knees, we crawled to get our kids. We have an 11 year old boy and a two year old girl. And then there was a second explosion. The third explosion came. We heard glass windows. We heard people crying, kids crying and people running on the streets. We didn't get out because we were scared. In the morning around 9 a.m., I found that the apartment next to our apartment got all the windows broken. They had kids. The soldiers that I now know were ice. They came into the apartment and they were throwing this kind of bomb in the apartment. They have kids, they have kids. They could have died. So at the city council meeting, several members in the community where these raids happened stood up and let the city council and those of us who attended this meeting know what had happened. And so I wanna talk about the ways that in Santa Cruz, this was um, hidden from us and what this means in terms of structural violence and cultural violence. So at this meeting, there were 31 speakers on this issue. 30 people spoke against the raid. In the paper the next day, there were only two mentions and there was no detail given. 
So I call this, I think this is a form of structural violence via percepticide because the broader community, unless you attended that meeting, you or were in the neighborhoods where this happened, you probably didn't know what had happened. And so the broader community still didn't know what had happened, even if they read the paper the next day. And I'm choosing to focus on the paper because as a community, this is our only local source of information that is um, you know, based in our community. So yes, there are um, you know, uh, news reports that we could watch like the, the news on TV, um, but those tend to be based in Monterey or San Francisco. So really, if we want to know what's happening in our local community, we should be able to look to our daily um, news source that is located in our community. So that's why I'm focusing on the Sentinel here, this, our, our local paper. So let's see um, what was in the paper. And so what I have here is the underlying words are consistent with the literature and the policy brief that I read to you um, or that, that I've gone through. And then um, I've color coded the, the forms of percepticide or structural violence and the cultural violence or the us versus them. So the paper says, now I am worried about the young people and the children who are going through this terror because I could call it terror. So notice here that there's, there's no detail given about what actually happened, even though the firsthand accounts were given. So that's why I'm calling this percepticide because what we get here in the paper is simply a conclusion with no description. So in the paper, the article goes on to say, a retired Santa Cruz County Sheriff deputy said that he applauded the police department for being involved in the raids, offering a calming influence. He sympathized with the stories of children who were upset by arrests. So let's talk about that term, we're upset. Like I'm upset if I can't find a parking place, right? Like these children were terrorized. And so this is another example of percepticide or the force looking away because the terms being used are not an accurate representation of what actually happened in this community. So the paper goes on to then quote this person saying, it's not the fault of the police department, it's the gang members. Those are the people that really should be held. So here then we see um, you know, this, this, uh, this distinction that's created in order to draw attention away from the violence that's carried out by the state. Instead using the label quote gang members to other those detained and blame them for the militarized ICE raids. So as a reminder, at the time of this particular um, city council meeting, nobody had yet been um, charged with any criminal counts. And the additional 10 people who were picked up during the raid, um, you know, there was no discussion of them either. So this is again, that sort of flattening and labeling people in particular ways and creating an us versus them. So then two weeks pass. And we move on to the second city council meeting. So again, the underlining is consistent with the review of the literature for the policy brief. The italics here are a refutation of this us versus them and criminalization narrative. So here's um, an example again of um, some testimonial that was given in this particular meeting. So I'm gonna read to you the entire testimonial here. A lot of people think that just because ICE came over to the house, they think badly of us. They think we are delinquent criminals. I looked through the window and I saw ICE coming. Obviously I felt fear. And first thing I told my son who's 11 was to take my five-year-old daughter and that I was going to pick up the baby and we were going to go out through the back and go by and leave by the fence. I didn't want anything bad to happen and I wanted to get away from them. So what happens is I saw ice. They were all lined up over around by the fence and they were pointing their weapons toward the inside. I told my son, no son, come along with me. And I thought they were pointing their weapons at us and they didn't even know who was going to come out of the houses and they were willing to shoot at anyone that came out. So my son started running and they saw him and they started either shooting or doing something like that. They or ICE were also pointing their weapon at another family and toward their back, toward his, the 14 year old son's back. 
and they were pulling him out of the house. They threw him on the truck so that they would search him and they did it very aggressively as if he was an adult or some sort of criminal, but he is not. And they had him outside on the cold for over two hours. All this is affecting our children. I feel really bad for my five-year-old. My five-year-old gets up every day and tells me, mom, don't worry, ice is not coming for you. Or at times she says, mom, don't worry, I'll be taking care of you. So we see here, again, another testimonial about the brutality of the direct violence that happened in our community around this raid and the way that it was affecting children and members of our community is very much aligned with the 30 years of research on what happens from these raids and deportations. So let's look at the structural and cultural violence that happens then. So in this case, there were 28 speakers at this next city council meeting. Every single person spoke against the raid, yet there was no mention of any testimony in the paper. So this is another example of structural violence that happened via percepticide. Again, the community was forced to look away and had no idea if again, what they did was read the paper to learn what had happened during this raid. Again, no idea. There's been no testimony, no direct description of what happened during this period. Instead, what we see is more cultural violence um, through the reporting in the paper. So here's a quote from the paper. The paper says, outcry followed the roundup with much of the Latino community speaking against the fear of deportation without due process. So again, no information. For this resident of Santa Cruz, the roundup had merit, according to an email she sent to the Sentinel address to the police department. What matters is they were caught, the resident said. It seems to me you don't care about the average citizen who lives here and has for a long time and would like to be safe. Wanting to harbor criminals seems to be more important to you than the good citizens who pay their taxes and want to live in peace and harmony. So a few things are really telling about this, the way that the paper reported on this city council meeting. Um, for example, they end up devoting much more time in the newspaper article to a letter that wasn't even written to them by somebody who wasn't even at the meeting. Right, so the letter was written to the police department and CC'd, she sent it to the Sentinel, but the Sentinel, it's CC'd to the Sentinel, it's given to the police department. But this is given more time and more space in the newspaper. And also we see again, this ideology of us versus them. You don't care about the average citizen, you know, creating these um, divisions and good citizens who pay their taxes, so here we see the sort of neoliberal idea of who should be here and who's considered good, people who pay taxes, um, even regardless of the fact that immigrants do pay a lot of taxes and even people who are unauthorized pay a lot of taxes. And also this narrative about immigrants, here we see that people are wanting to harbor criminals, so the criminalization of people who are immigrants. So again, this continues the cultural and structural violence that happened after the raid in our community. So now I've talked through um, the cultural and structural violence that happens through the reporting and how this then reduces community cohesion and solidarity in our community because people have very little sense, again, unless they attended these meetings or were in the neighborhoods or knew somebody who was directly impacted, um, this would reduce community cohesion and solidarity because so few people know about what actually happened during these raids. So I wanna move into, so now I've talked through this whole picture here. So now what I'm gonna do is move into how we can counteract this kind of violence um, at sort of multiple levels. The first level is a conceptual or ideological level. So it's important that we make links between, that we make, you know, that we understand the links between mass deportation and mass incarceration and other types of violence against underrepresented and misrepresented groups. So the whole reason that we can have 
a mass deportation system set up at this time is because it's built on a system of mass incarceration that you know has been in place since the beginning of um, the drug wars and before that. Um, so you know it's important to really make these links clear and to understand that um, there are points of solidarity here in terms of what's happened in black and brown communities and you know what happens around deportation and people who don't have authorization to be in the US. And so this can be a place of bringing people together for solidarity. Michelle Alexander has a nice um, interview talking about this on Democracy Now! in May 2017. If you search for it, you'll find it. Another um, maybe quite provocative idea comes from a law professor, Professor Achume. She makes the argument that the colonial project involved in the outmigration of at least 62 million European Americans who left their home countries to colonize the rest of the world between 1800 and 1950. Through this process, resources were extracted from colonized lands and went to dominate our communities. Laws were also created that benefit the colonizer. This process created a permanent power imbalance. So we need to understand global political economic migration today as an attempt to rebalance power, which makes this migration part of a decolonial project. Achume defines decol decolonization as the pursuit of a long overdue geopolitical reordering of benefits of a global order defined by interdependence defined in the colonial area, era. This act of decolonization is especially the case for the unauthorized migrant whose behavior must be understood as a political act of resistance to colonization given global political and economic colonial structures that continue to extract resources from colonized lands. There will always be a colonial advantage given the advantages already reaped by the colonizers. So the most likely way to rebalance power is migration to the land taken by the colonizer. Again, a very provocative idea, but one that is maybe worth us considering. In terms of acting locally, um, engaging in advocacy is also important so we can strengthen sanctuary policies and make sure that people feel welcome and that they are not being um, you know, constantly threatened in our communities. We can also ensure comprehensive immigration reform so this is really sorely needed and you know right now is the moment to really advocate for this so according to lee gellerant one of the lead attorneys for the aclu this is the group that brought the case of family separation at the border against the current administration so as of this past friday there are still currently 628 children separated from their parents and this is down from a thousand even after the court told the administration to stop separating children from their parents, the administration continued to separate somewhere between 1,100 and 1,200 children from their parents. The administration continues to separate parents from their children if they think the child is in danger. But the thing is, it's not social workers who are making these determinations. It's ICE officials who don't have training in social work. And they're separating children on the grounds that they have decided that their parents are a danger to them. Why are they a danger? Because they crossed the border, or maybe they had a DUI 10 years ago. So the Trump administration refused to look for the parents. And this is why other groups like Justice in Motion have formed to take on this work to actually find the parents of these children who have been separated. But it's been slow going due to obstruction by the current administration and because the contact information that the administration gives, once they give it, is often useless because the parents were separated so long ago. It's just old information. So Lee Gellerant thinks the only reason why the administration even gave this contact information to reach parents is because of public outcry, not because the courts mandated it. So all of this is from a webinar that I attended on Friday. So it's up to date information. But that is just to say that, you know, moving one from the current administration to the incoming administration is not enough because these policies have been going on since the Clinton administration. So we really need to change these policies overall. And this level of, of public agitation and advocacy is gonna be needed to do that. 
Also, we can make sure that there are no 287G agreements between police and the Department of Homeland Security or ICE. The 287G agreement is one that says that local police can act as ICE. And I can tell you in Santa Cruz, there is not a 287G agreement. Um, but if you're living somewhere else, you should find out if you have this agreement in your community. And also it's important that there are watchdog groups so that, that um, people who are perpetuating violence like this know that they are being watched. In terms of direct action, um, you know, all of this, it also ends up um, funneling down to, to um, street, um, street violence as well, just in terms of how people treat one another every day in their lives. So if you're out and about, which maybe we're not so much these days during the pandemic, um, but if you see street violence occurring and if you are um, willing and able and comfortable doing so, you can also be a bystander to intervene on that action. And so there are some um, links that are available that I think are maybe going into the chat, um, but I Holla Back is a good organization for this. They do virtual um, trainings on this distance, virtual distance trainings that are interactive. And there's also a webinar on the Society for Community Research and Action page that's really um, a good one about this. You can become a legal observer. Here locally, we have a group called Your Allied Rapid Response. There are also rapid response groups across um, California. So you can get involved, you can learn how to do legal observation, and you can, um, you know, be an observer and write down what you see happening when there is a raid. And that information can sometimes stop a deportation if um, the, the rules weren't followed as they're supposed to be followed. And if you're not of the social group, then you need to learn about positionality and solidarity work. So the Catalyst Project is one great place um, where white people can go to learn more about anti-racist work. The same with showing up for racial justice or surge. So we definitely have, um, you know, places where we can learn more about, in this case, what it means to be a white person who wants to do work around immigration justice or anti-racist work. There are other groups as well. Um, if you have money to give, then you can give to organizations for Know Your Rights training. And also for DACA applications, the courts have told the current administration that they need to reopen DACA applications. They were told this um, before and they didn't do it. Basically what they did is they made it so that people who already had DACA and who had already qualified for DACA could reapply for a one-year extension. Um, so the courts more recently have said that they need to open it up to everybody who would be uh, able to apply for it. And I think move it back to the two-year uh, period. So we'll see if that happens um, before this administration ends and the next one begins. You can also fundraise for bonds, emergency aid, and these are really important um, or for attorneys because the number one thing that a person can do to not get deported who has been brought in um, for being unauthorized is to have a lawyer, to have an immigration attorney. Um, and also you can fundraise, you can give money to reunite families. Um, and so the organization that I mentioned, Justice in Motion, is one group that is doing this work and really doing really important work to try to track down the family members who have been deported, the parents who are often in very rural areas, um, trying to find them so that they can reunite the parents and the children. Also, it's important to practice dangerous seeing. So dangerous seeing is seeing that which was not given to be seen. We need to seek it and find it and make it visible to others. So, you know, I um, know about this information about what happened at the city council meetings because I attended them. I also was um, live Facebook blogging what people were saying. And then to do what I'm presenting to you today, we went back to the city council meetings. They're all, um, you can go back and re-listen or re-watch all of them. So we went and pulled that information together. So, you know, me making this visible to you is also a form of dangerous seeing because it means we're refusing to look away from what actually happened. And we're, we're um, we create a rupture when we do this. We create an opening for community cohesion, solidarity and action because 
it rehumanizes and we can see one another for what actually happened. We can also practice a healing justice model. So a way of thinking about community well-being, this is a way of thinking about community well-being that brings together social justice, healing and action. It's used in schools and youth programs around the country and has shown positive results in the psychological and educational literatures. So oftentimes schools will adopt curriculum or, or create curriculum that works on first building community in the space, addressing an issue, working together to develop a courageous vision and then acting collectively. And all of this, when we're working together, can create a space where there's healing for collective hope and well-being. And that's so important these days, um, not only for these issues, but just the, the violence that happens in our communities in general. And so these are some examples of our youth participatory action research. And um, these are murals that the young people have created with us. And all of these murals were created um, because the students were wanting to increase their sense of connection and belonging to their school. And they wanted to see stories that represented them. They wanted these stories to be visible to the entire community. And they wanted them to be permanently displayed. And so we know that the stories that are told about us, the stories that circulate about us in our community, these are really important as well because these stories tell us who we are, who we've been, and who we can be. So if the stories about us are steeped in this kind of cultural violence, this us versus them, this criminalization narrative, these are not good stories. They're not stories filled with hope and possibility. So by young people, talking to other students at the school, by talking to their parents, by talking to their teachers, by you know collecting all of these stories, by running these focus groups and by analyzing the stories and finding out what are the common threads and by you know making these stories that are actually grounded in the lived experiences of their community, they make another world possible because these additional stories then become visible to more people in the community. So with our, our research program, um, what our young people wanted to really focus on was to think about, um, you know, after they had created these three murals and decided that they had really addressed this issue of bringing in community stories into their school um, permanently, they wanted to focus on another issue. And so what they did is they decided on a new issue to focus on um, a few months after these ice raids happened in our local community. And so um, what they decided that they wanted to focus on was what had happened in the community in general. And you know, they had lots of stories that they told about their own experiences in seeing what had happened and you know, stories that they had heard about or saw with people's windows being broken, with um, people being thrown around, like the stories that I shared with you from the city council meeting. And what they really wanted to have happen was to have ICE or La Migra and the police being held responsible and accountable for their actions. They essentially were saying that they wanted um, ICE and, and law enforcement to be respectful. And this was something that was really important to them. So through this process then, what they did is they really worked on this courageous vision. For them, it was really important that everybody who lives in our county feels welcome in our county and feels that they are being treated respectfully in our county, regardless of their immigration status. And so what they decided to do was to create some artwork based on a photo voice project that they engaged in where they did some research. So photo voices where they're given a prompt, they go out and they take pictures. They also did some collaging around this to get some ideas about what could go in this artwork and really what is it that would represent their own stories and what happened in their community. And so they created some artwork and they also made a documentary. And I'm gonna share the artwork with you now. They did this with the assistance of a critical muralist named Chile de Fuentes. And so they created this artwork um, again, based on their own research of, of immigration and also what happened in their community. 
and they created a documentary where they came up with the questions, they interviewed different people in our broader community. Um, that documentary is now on YouTube, you can watch it. I think the link is in the, the chat. Um, and they co-produced that documentary. It also showed in town in a few places um, before the, the pandemic started. So with this, I'm going to wrap up. I think I've stayed in my time. And I want to um, thank especially the, the Change for Good researchers, the nine through 12 year olds who we worked with on this participatory action research, also the coordinators of the program, my policy brief co-authors, and um, some other folks who are really important in this entire process, the funders who made this, the research portion of this possible, the Society for Community Research and Action, Juan, Nicole, and all of the people on the back end who you can't see who are involved with University Forum who have been engaged in the tech here who are helping everything run smoothly. So with that, I'm gonna stop my screen share. And I guess turn it back over to Juan. All right, thank you so much for that. Uh, so such a timely presentation. Uh, so we're back here. Uh, we've gotten uh, some questions already uh, about your research and all of everything that you just laid out for us. I wanted to start with um, your work and how you thought uh, about this this uh, project, um, the idea, the it's an implementation. Uh, and I'm seeing at least some uh, questions here on some of the collateral downstream consequences of of raids and percepticide and all these forms of violence. But first, could you tell us a little bit about um, how did you uh, launch yourself into this project, think to collect both the uh, firsthand data of people that were giving testimony in those council meetings, but also the uh, youth particip participatory project, uh, working with young people and uh, what that took to launch that. Um, so if you could give us a sense of that. And uh, since uh, we're talking about data, uh, there is a question. They, they're curious if, uh, if we wanted to read those testimonies, the full, the full text, um, and the excerpts that you gave us, where might we find some of that data? So I think people are really, really curious to know even more what got left out of the Sentinel. Um, yeah. Okay, I will take them in sort of reverse order. I made a note for myself here. So if I don't hit them all, then make sure you ask me to ask again. All right, so um, in terms of the Sentinel, I gave you the, the dates or the city council meetings. I gave you the dates of both of the city council meetings in terms of uh, what, um, in terms of the slides. And if you go to the Santa Cruz um, city council website, you can click through. I, I won't be able to do it while we're on this webinar, but I, you know, because I can't talk and like look things up at the same time, not yet anyway. Um, but you could uh, look at all of the previous meetings and they have up the, um, all of the, they record them all. So they do a video recording of the meetings and you can watch all of the meetings yourself. So what we did is we found the places in the meeting. So one of them, it's at the beginning of the meeting. The other is in the middle of the meeting. With the first meeting, it's at the beginning because the comments are during the open period. With the second meeting, it was an agenda item. So you have to like go through and like find the right agenda item. But that second meeting also has a report from the, um, the police chief at the time and from some other folks when they were talking about what had happened. Um, in case you don't remember, there was a huge brouhaha about this because our local police chief said that they didn't know about these additional 10 people who were picked up. And then we ended up in like the national news because there was a big argument between Department of Homeland Security and our local PD. Department of Homeland Security was saying they knew about it. So there's a, there's a lot there in the second meeting as well, but they're all curated on the um, Santa Cruz City Council website. So that's where you can go to find that. Um, so that's the data question. In terms of involvement, so this project started, you know, we did this work, this youth participatory action research for about 12 years, and it started based on an introduction that was made to me from Ron Glass, who's a professor in the education department. And what had happened was he had worked with Radagawa, who's another professor in the education department to hold an education summit and invited um, several different school districts from our broader region to attend. 
um, just to get a sense of who would like to partner, who would like to be engaged in work. And um, he started working with some of the folks who attended that meeting, but there was more interest than the folks in the ed department could um, serve. And so when I got to campus then, a year after him and attended a, a meeting that he was at or that he was giving a, a talk that he was giving, I started asking a bunch of questions. So at that point, he introduced me to people at, at another school and I got involved at that point. So, you know, it just started with building that relationship and um, getting involved with the principal at that time and a couple of the teachers who were interested in it and then developing a, eventually an after school program to really give um, young people the space and so I see my role as just sort of opening up a space for them to talk about the things that they want to talk about and then figuring out like what they need to do the work. And so, you know, I think this is really important. In the US, we're the only country that hasn't ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so um, we don't have the same kinds of spaces often that are held in other countries for young people to speak up, um, young people who are even younger than this to speak up and to have a say. And so really this project just evolved out of my interest in thinking about what does it mean to be young and to wanna to be civically engaged and to not have those opportunities or openings. And then when we layer on that through an intersectional perspective, what does it mean to be Latinx? What does it mean to be from a mixed status family? What does it mean to maybe not have authorization? You know, all of these sort of structures that are saying you shouldn't be involved in society um, when really everyone should be involved in society. Everybody lives here, you know? So really trying to take that perspective and then just sort of long-term um, being engaged and in, in involved in the work and being willing to go the places that the young people wanna go. Um, and so that's, that's the way that the project unfolded. And then us also just really trying to develop tools that would be appropriate to use with nine through 12 year olds to teach them how to do all of this work. So that's sort of like a, a whole longer more technical than maybe we need to get into for today. Um, and in terms of long-term effects, you know, um, in terms of the policy brief, like I had mentioned, what we saw was about two years out. In our own community, I think what this looks like is, you know, still people don't understand really what happened. A lot of people don't understand what happened during this raid. There was another raid that happened a year later in February where you know there are still effects happening from that rate as well. Part of the reason why we ended up opening up the space for our young people to focus on this is because they kept talking about it in the after school program. It didn't matter what we were raising, they just kept raising it and talking about it over and over and over again. So they obviously needed a space in which to talk about what had happened and to feel like they could take some action on it, right? Because that's a really important part of that, of healing is to not be um, without the ability to make a change in your community, without the ability to let other people know what happened. So um, yeah, I think that the effects are likely to be, you know, very long-term. And from what I know from other people in our community who have undergone, who have, who have been, the targets of these kinds of violence or been bystanders, um, you know, we're talking years later, still um, the trauma from it. Thank you for that. And having read your work and gotten into the details of um, testimonies that students and people who attended those council meetings, um, it just seems like there, there's just so much to document to make sure that it, this is not forgotten. Um, so this gets at the issue of, of trust. Um, it takes a lot of trust to work with young people. Uh, these were, I believe it was fourth and fifth graders, is that right? Yes. Yeah, and uh, the stories that they gave, the, the murals that you showed, um, clearly creating a constructive space uh, for them to express themselves. So I think that that's a testament to the project, uh, to the young people who spoke up. Uh, there's a question here along these lines of trust from Matthew Weisner, uh, who works from, um, Santa Cruz County Immigration Project. And he's wondering, you know, there's all of these immigration benefits out here for example, immigrants who witness crime, who wanna come forward and say either I was a victim of crime or I saw something happen. Uh, technically, there's supposed to be a form of relief if you are unauthorized or, or don't have regular immigration status, uh, where you can apply for a visa, for example, if you're working with law enforcement to bring justice to someone who's been the victim of a crime, or you yourself are a victim of a crime. His question is, can you speak 
to how participation of the Santa Cruz Police Department in these ICE raids uh, affected trust between local community and law enforcement. Yeah, I think that's um, covered in the policy brief as well. So what we know from, from many, many studies, not just one study, and from places all over the US, whether they're large metro areas, small rural areas, it doesn't matter that when local police are involved with ICE or are there during ICE raids, what happens is that all of this gets, um, you know, pushed down so that there's just law enforcement period. And so what that means then is that um, people just won't call the police for anything, even if they're victims themselves of a crime. And even if they have authorization, even if they were born in the US, it doesn't matter at that point because the trust is so broken at that point that, that there's not gonna be that kind of outreach. And so, you know, I, I think part of what needs to happen is there, it needs to be well known in, in a community that you know the community that the police are not participating in a 287G agreement. They're not participating in secure communities. Our community was participating in secure communities, which is the linking of the local um, database up to the federal database so that the feds could sort of search that database to see, um, you know, is there somebody without authorization? Are they gonna be released soon? Could we come and pick them up? So not participating in these kinds of programs and projects, and you know, beyond that, I'm not really sure what to say. I can say how I build trust in this, you know, in in this community with the young people, and that's things like having icebreakers and not just sending them off to do the icebreaker, but you know, like if we're playing games, you know, they're, they're like nine to twelve year, years old. So if we're doing this game called like graveyard, which is where people lay down on the ground, I'm down there laying down on the ground with them, you know. So I really want to, you know, participate and be a part of. And when young people know that you are really listening to them like that is meaningful and then that changes the relationship as well you know i've had several young people say to me like oh you're actually listening to what i'm saying you know so i think if we take them seriously that goes a long way too and i would say in terms of you know our broader community well we need to follow the lead of you know people who have been impacted and just say what can i do to be a support and then actually do it and follow through and yeah it's going to take a long time it takes a long time to build this trust back up when it's broken i think you've said that so well the uh, young people is they can know when you're invested and when you're listening um and having been teaching at uh, uc santa cruz just for a couple of years i can i can see that already the students really sort of light up when you can uh, when you ask questions that show that you're listening. So it sounds like that's part of the, the it's a process. Building trust is a process. Um, and these kinds of raids and uh, different forms of violence make it even tougher for those of us who wanna be doing work in the community. Um, so it makes the work even more important. A couple of questions. And I think, let me just say one more thing about that one, naming that, right? Because we're at an institution and, you know, the person who was speaking up from the, um, from Skip, they're at an institution. And so that's part of this too, is that trust in all institutions gets degraded. So even naming that, like, you know, saying to somebody like, I know it's hard to reach out right now. And I want to commend you for doing it. And is there anything I can do to make that easier? So I think just naming it and moving from there is important too. Yeah, and it's um, the cases you've highlighted for us. These are flashpoints. Uh, the raids happen without notice. Uh, I mean, ICE is supposed to be letting social services know that these are coming. Don't necessarily do that under Trump uh, administration. So these are flashpoints. They happen without notice. Then you have to descend with rapid response and try to figure out who's been harmed. Um, and after it's over, there's all of this damage left. Uh, so in terms of picking up the pieces, think of all the damage. Uh, you've talked about psychological, social, psychological, um, emotional uh, harm of losing income, right? Because you're losing someone who's, who's helping pay the rent. Um, there's a question here from one of our attendants who wants to know who pays for you know, the property damage, uh, everything that happens during these raids. Um, is this ICE that's footing a bill for anything? Is the police footing the bill? Is this basically on tenants? Uh, what's going on? Yeah, I don't know who's supposed to pay for it. What I can tell you is that in our community, the people who paid for it were the tenants in the apartments that were raided. Yeah. So yeah, not only then have you been through this, there's also been 
you know, the then having to pay for windows being broken, doors being broken in, sinks being broken, you know, just so many things that have happened. Another form of uh, direct violence, right? You're yes. literally having to pick up the pieces of someone using the force of the state um, on your private home. Um, since we're talking here about different forms of violence, I want to- And can I just say one other thing about this? I mean, this is a place for some mutual aid and mutual solidarity, right? So like, I know that your allied rapid response has, um, you know, they organize people who then, if somebody has the skills to repair something, will go and do it for free, right? So there are definitely ways that we can work together as a community, but first we have to know what actually happened, right? Yeah. So that's that thing about like, if we, do that dangerous thing and we refuse to look away and we re-engage even though we're in a system in a setting that wants us disengaged if we re-engage then that can help us to develop you know to rebuild that trust and to to develop a strong community where people aren't out there on their own or having to do this stuff by themselves right right yeah that's powerful insights um question here from juan poblete uh, percepticide is both a form of self-blinding and dehumanizing that it disempowers. Uh, so both of those effects are not manifested on the victims of direct violence, but instead on those around them, which is us, all of us uh, that are, are implicated in this. Uh, could you expand on this form of violence and its effects on the general population? What is at stake when we're thinking about that? Yeah, so I think it's a, a great question and um, maybe I'll try to make some of those links a little bit more clearly. I was hoping that they, you know, kind of came through a little bit, but I'm happy to um, to make them a little bit more explicit. So, you know, when, for example, the paper doesn't tell us about what happened and we don't have other ways of finding out, mm -hmm. then we won't reach out and say, hey, I actually know how to repair a door or I know how to repair a window or whatever, right? So that community cohesion, that ability to act in solidarity, all of that goes away. So then what ends up happening is the people who have been um, criminalized in this way are gonna pull back even more from society and that's gonna create even more social isolation. So what ends up happening then when when there is this percepticide, this force looking away and individual looking away, is that we become even more fragmented and splintered as a community. And when we are more fragmented and splintered and people are pulling back, that harms all of us in terms of all of our so social and psychological outcomes because we're all in this community together. And if somebody else is, is hurt, even if they're not connected to me. That's, you know, that's the findings from this research is that we are all connected, even if we don't all know it. So that sort of splintering just creates more and more problems. Yeah. Um, yes. You, you mentioned not looking away um, at different points in your presentation. And one of the suggestions that I, I got away from your message is not just in the moment, but to keep looking, uh, to think about long-term effects. You mentioned a couple of studies that um, had two years, you know, follow up to see what happened, not just in the aftermath, but in the in that immediate long-term uh, year or two years out. Um, and part of paying attention is, hold on, we just had these raids. Here were the supposed reason for the raids. Um, do we know at the end of the day uh, for those who were, um, you know, either maybe they signed a voluntary departure or they were forcibly removed from this country? Do we know how many people got deported and how many may have had this supposed uh, criminal record, for example, affiliation with MS-13? I mean, that, that seems like if this was the impetus for, for causing so much damage, uh, uh, if we pay attention long enough, how, how good is ICE and making sure that they're targeting their enforcement on the supposed serious offenders that is the catalyst for these operations? Mm -hmm. uh. Agreed. <laughs> and, you know, not only not looking away, but thinking about how can we mitigate? Mm -hmm. And I think that gets into your area of expertise, Juan. So maybe you want to say a little bit about mitigation too. Yeah, I mean, at first oversight, uh, where if we're going to be entrusting uh, law enforcement officers at the local level, state level, federal level to be 
um, operating in these communities, we need to figure out our, do people have the proper training? Uh, do people know the limits of their authority? Um, you know, there, this shouldn't be a license to go out and do whatever you want. Um, and at the same time, if we have trained judges, uh, trained law enforcement officers that want to be serving their communities, should they have the discretion to say, hey, you know, we're not, uh, we're not here to police you on immigration. We're here to serve. We're here to protect. So if you have something to share with us, um, we can help bring some justice to your community, but we won't share that with ICE. There's a firewall there that can mitigate some harm. Um, also, I think just making sure that we all know, um, you know, to the extent that people who don't have grounds to stay in the country, um, oftentimes they don't have criminal records. Um, I personally would love to know in, the, in these raids, you know, how many of those actually were MS-13 gang members. And even if they are, um, is deportation the solution? Because uh, there's mitigating harm in the short term, then there's mitigating harm in the long term. Uh, are, we, are we deporting people to then foment more social problems in sending communities? And does that become a, a circle? Um, so these are sort of questions that, that keep me up at night. Um, and I think being able to document what's going on in our local community so that it's not abstract. Right? People hear a deportation machine or the Trump administration or the Obama administration or who was the deporter in chief. It's like, well, a lot of these things happen at the local level. Um, so I think that that's why this, this work is so, so important. Um, yeah, I want to, um, if we have time here, I think we do have, uh, we go till seven. So we've got seven more minutes here. I do see a new question that popped up. Um, uh, thank you from one of the attendees here. Uh, I learned about dangerous seeing and how the Sentinel is useless slash worthless for real news. Um, yeah, any reactions to the obligations that media have? Yeah, I think this is a particularly sticky thing to talk about because, you know, the Sentinel was owned by a local family. Um, I would say which, but I'm afraid I'm going to get it wrong, so I don't want to misspeak. And then it was sold to another organization, to like a, a, yeah, an organization. And then it was sold to, a, um, oh, what's it called? Like a, what's the, um, Oh shoot, I had it and now it's gone. Like a, um, do you know one? <laughs> um, it's like a, uh, something that has like junk bond status, right? It's like, it, it's, it, it was just uh, sold to, um, oh, it's in the paper. I'd have to look up the paper. But basically what ha what's happened is that the papers aren't seen as something that makes a lot of money at this point. So then they just end up, you know, like bought and sold by all of these huge conglomerates. And then they end up getting like um, gutted from the inside. So if we even want to talk about like how many reporters are left at the Sentinel, even compared to 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or even five years ago, like, what does that mean? Um, and so, you know, I think, especially if the press is supposed to be this like fourth a state um, on our checks and balances, like it's really important that we have a robust media and a robust local media, especially. So I know that, um, you know, a couple of former people who worked at the Sentinel have started Santa Cruz Local, that's a podcast. Um, I think because of their dissatisfaction as well with what was going on, you know, at the Sentinel, again, because of, you know, all of this buying and selling and now it's just been for the most part, completely gutted. So I, I wanna hold the Sentinel accountable and also not feel like I'm saying that, you know, the however many people are left working there have to work, you know, 16 hours a day, every day in order to do that, that kind of work, but also what it means to maybe not have anybody in our local community in the media who's really involved and embedded and engaged and from the neighborhoods that in this case were raided. And, and that's another important piece of it. In your work, you're very clear that it's not one person or even one organization. These are structural problems. So if we wanna find solutions, we need to find structural solutions. And it, your work points to narratives as one way to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm teaching a class right now in sociology on immigration enforcement and deportations. And the theme for the week is 
uh, narratives and uh, counter narratives and resistance. Uh, what sort of advice would you give um, our students and the larger community about, um, okay, so we've seen some narratives that are, are slanted to say the least. Um, how do we change this conversation in a constructive way that we can all be invested in and buy into um, moving forward? Yeah, it's a good question. And I remembered it's a hedge fund. It's a hedge fund that owns the Santa Cruz Sentinel. So that seems like a problem, right? So, um, you know, I, I don't, I, a number of community psychologists, they have their students in their classes making like short, um, you know, video clips or sharing things via social media as another way to think about like, how do we get additional narratives out there? So I think you know, in our local community, we might think about our independent media, like the Indie Bay, we might think about Santa Cruz Local, we might think about the good times, um, or we might think about what can we create? Um, can we take over next door so that, you know, this is what's happening there? Um, and, you know, can we really think about, I guess, organizing in particular ways and thinking about these stories and telling these stories as ways to organize communities, you know, so part of what I've done tonight is say, like, get involved in your local rapid response, get involved, you know, there are different things that we can do, we can take this information, and we can plug back into our local communities with other people, because no single person is going to solve any of this, right. So it's about like, organizing and working together, and um, attending events such as this, um, so that you can hear what's happening and what has happened. And, you know, really, um, trying to find out how this information is spread and how you can amplify it. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, um, I know we're nearing the end here. I did wanna make sure to point out, uh, someone had a comment about the overlap between mass incarceration and immigration, what some people call crimmigration, and that mm -hmm. way that it's not an accident that we've turned uh, criminal justice capacity on immigrants increasingly. Um, so I feel like you've, you've made those connections so clear, clearly um, part of the way that we need to talk about these issues moving forward is to recognize those intersections um, and to go forward together. I feel like that was a really powerful uh, approach that you mentioned at the end. Um, do we have a moment for a question or would you, um, do you want any, any closing thoughts for us? I'll give you a second to, to think about that. Um. I see we have one minute left. I guess this is the thing about being on Zoom. We can all see our clocks. Don't you have a little wrap up that you need to do too? Yes, that's true. I should. Okay, so why don't we transition into that? Thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. I've, I've learned a lot and I'm sure everyone attending has as well. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, please join us again on January 13th of 2021, where we will all celebrate the end of 2020 and also come back for uh, suddenly distant and still in flux, the implications of COVID-19 for K through 12 teachers work and schooling with Professor Laura Bartlett. And uh, thank you for coming and uh, sharing your thoughts and learning from Professor Langham.